Hello, and welcome to the seventh lover lecture of type systems. So in this lecture, we're going to wrap up how uh, our look at system F, and then we're going to move on to programming with effects. So, so far we've looked at how to compute answers, and now we'll start looking at how to change the world with a program. So let's go move on to wrapping up polymorphism. So. What we've seen in System F is a way of programming, a, a style of programming that lets you program generically. We have a, a, a universally quantified type for all alpha dot b, and this has a this is a term b which works for any choice of type alpha. And so whenever we have something of polymorphic type, what we're allowed to do is we're allowed to supply a type argument, and then we get an instantiation of B. So we'll substitute A for alpha in, in, uh, in B, and that's the, that's the type of the type application. So by changing the type argument to the polymorphic type, to the polymorphic function, we're able to change the type at which you can use it. And so this is all very fine in uh, theory, but you can ask, okay, well, we've introduced polymorphic poly, uh, parametric polymorphism. What do programs actually look like when you use it? Um, and it turns out that they are uh, extremely explicit. In, in fact, they're unbearably explicit. So suppose that we have a map function, like you learned about in 1A, where you, where you, get, where you have a function alpha to beta, and that means that ma the map function will take a list of alphas to a list of betas by applying the function argument uh, um, once for every element of the list. And then let's suppose we also have a function is even, which takes a natural number and tells you if it's a Boolean. And so you might think, okay, well, if I want to apply map to is even, I will need to tell it that alpha is, is the natural number type and beta is the Boolean type. And then I will be able to get something that takes a list of natural numbers and yields a list of Booleans. Okay, so that's fine. It's a little clunky, but it's fine. But what happens if you have a list of list of a list of lists of natural numbers? So you have a list, and every element of that list is a list of natural numbers. What happens if we want to find out if every one of those things is a boolean? So this kind of data structure comes up when you're like implementing sparse matrices and things like that. And so if you want to find out if every element is even, well, what you want to do is you want to take your function, eve is even, and then you want to uh, give it to map. And now you have something which takes a list of natural numbers to a list of Booleans. And so then you can pass that to map again and you'll get something that takes a list of list of natural numbers to a list of list of booleans. But hang on, look at these type arguments. So for the inner map, we have natural numbers and booleans. And for the outer map, we have, a, we have the, the two type arguments become list nat and list bool. And let's actually count the number of symbols here. So we have one, two, three symbols that actually do anything, that tell us what computation we want to do. And we have one, two, three, four symbols that correspond to type arguments. Or in fact, and some of those I actually, I actually undercounted, like we have list nat and list bool and nat and bool. So if we counted it token by token, you end up with six tokens of annotations and three tokens of program. So the type arguments are totally overwhelming the actual program. And if you try to do anything that's even a little bit more complicated than this, like there are so many type annotations that you can't even read the program. So the programming practically with system F is unviable because it's just too clunky. Luckily, languages like ML and Haskell and nowadays even languages like C-sharp and, and uh, 
uh, Java, they have started to grow some type inference. And what this means is that you don't need to write explicit type applications. So you can just write map is even, and you don't have to write map nat bool is even. And the way that the compiler figures out what types everything, all these polymorphic things are supposed to be is by an algorithm called type inference. And what type inference does is it uh, is basically a kind of constraint propagation. So whenever you, whenever you uh, have a type that you don't know what it should be, you introduce what's called a unification variable. And as you type check the rest of the program, you incrementally solve these constraints to figure out what the type applications should have been. So let's look at map is even. So this is our term that needs some type inference to happen. And because map has the type for all alpha, for all beta, alpha to beta to list alpha to list beta, what we need to do is we need to introduce two placeholders. So I'm writing question mark A and question mark B for the placeholder types for what alpha and beta should be instantiated to. We don't know what they are yet, but we are just going to introduce a placeholder. And now the type of map question mark alpha question mark beta is if you give me uh, something to something, then I will produce a list of the first something to a list of the second something. Okay, and we know that the type of is even is nat arrow bool. So we are required, so what we want is for question mark A arrow question mark B to actually be nat arrow bool. And this tells us that question mark alpha is nat and question mark B is bool and because this is the only choice that of a, a variable assignment that makes question mark A to question mark B equal the type nat arrow bool. And so what we're able to do is we introduce some constraint variables and then we wait for the types of other terms to tell us what these uh, type variables have to, uh, have to be instantiated to. And this is a really pretty algorithm and it has a lot of nice properties and unfortunately I don't have time in this lecture to explain how it works. So a few years ago, I think 2016, Andy Pitts taught a version of types in which he in which he uh, explained the ML type inference algorithm in detail. So if you go online and look at the 2016 type types lectures, you'll see a completely different course and that completely different course will explain how the unification algorithm and how ML type inference work. But in this uh, but in this course, we're going to move on now. And the thing we're going to move on to is effects. So We've introduced the simply typed lambda calculus in the so far, and we said this is basically constructive propositional logic. So, you know, it's six of one, half a dozen of the other. These two have a tight correspondence between uh, between the two of them. And then, after introducing uh, data structures and sums and products and things like that, we saw that the logical interpretation continued to work and everything continued to terminate. And then we extended this to the polymorphic lambda calculus, to the Gerard Reynolds polymorphic lambda calculus. And we saw that we still had a Curry Howard correspondence. So the polymorphic lambda calculus has a second life as second order logic. And so, so far, this looks like a beautiful story, but if you've actually written any programs ever, you'll have noticed that something is missing. So this is a story of pure, total functional programming. And every single one of you, and me too, have written programs that we thought should give us an answer, but actually go into an infinite loop. And in languages like System F and Godel's T, that's actually impossible. So. That's definitely a difference between everyday programming and these core type theories. And another difference is that these core type theories represent a model of pure, pure functional programming. They have no way of 
ha- uh, adding having side effects. And you know, sometimes this is all right. Like we do, in fact, write many programs that take an input and compute an answer for us. So if you're implementing a physics simulation, the important thing is you've got your model, you've got your initial conditions, and you want to know what will actually happen. Or if you're a computer programmer, you're, what you'll do is you write your program and you feed it to a uh, compiler and it will either say yes and give you a binary or it'll say you made a type error. And so again, this is a pure f- uh, a function that takes an input and gives you a deterministic output. And you know, another one, like many of you have implemented, is ray tracing software. So you take a description of a scene and then you grind for a bit and you get out a a beautiful image that uh, that you can like print out and hang up on your wall. Okay, so these are all all fine programs that fit into the natural functional view of the world. But there are other kinds of programs that actually do things. So maybe we want to write a program like a web browser that can communicates with the outside world and it does IO and networking. And maybe we want to update physical state, like you want to save a file maybe. And then when you power off your computer and turn it back on, that file is still there. Maybe you want to build a PDF viewer so that you can lecture to a eager, uh, eager collection of students who want to learn about type theory. Or maybe you just want a robot or to generate some random numbers. There are a lot of times that we write programs not for not for an input output reason, but to actually do something. And this process of doing something, the modeling doing something in programming language jargon is called the distinction between pure and effectful code. So a pure program just takes an input, yields an output, and that's the end of the story. And an effectful program takes an input and then it may give you an answer, but along the way it will do things as well. It'll have an effect on the world. And from the point of view of type theory, it turns out that there are actually two main categories of effects. The first category of effects that you run into is state. So these are things like mutable data structures like hash tables and arrays and pointers and, you know, all the things you learned about in C programming and, um, you know, you have memory and you can modify it and you can uh, modify the memory that someone else is reading in order to communicate with them. And the other form of effect that happens, that arises most commonly, are what are called control effects. And these are things that change the control flow of your program. So you might raise an exception, maybe you'll invoke some threads. You m- in languages like uh, these days, JavaScript and C Sharp, what you can do is you've got coroutines or generators, which will let you yield a value to your caller and then suspend execution until you're forced to evaluate again. And so this way you can incrementally enumerate some values. So these kinds of generators have like, you know, weird, um, weird control flow. That's not a simple function call input output kind of, uh, uh, in, input, out kind, input output kind of behavior. And, you know, it turns out that practically every effect that we've ever thought of can be modeled as some combination of state and control effects. And so in this lecture, we're just going to f- focus on the first bullet point, state and how to model it in a programming language. And in fact, there are many ways to model state. We're just going to focus on one of them. So, if you've programmed in OCaml, you've probably seen something that looks like this. You, if you want state, you can get it. You have a reference type. And what you can do is you can create a reference. You can read a, you can read a value from it. So if you want to create a reference, you write ref e. If you, want to, if you have a reference and you want to know what it contains, you call bang e. So a C programmer would write star e. And you can re- update the reference too. And you can say e, the e has its contents updated to e prime. And once you've done the update, subsequent reads will give you a new value. So I have some code on the slide here, but it's always nice to actually run things. So um, let's actually run the OCaml top level here. And so we can create a reference. Let's call it R and let's give it five. 
that was on the slide. Mm -hmm. That's a fine choice. And R is a reference. So if we try to add R to a number, we get a type error that says, well, you wrote R plus three, and that means R should be an integer, but it's actually a pointer to an integer. So if you want to actually use that contents, you have to dereference it. So now if you dereference it with the bang operator, which is the dereference operator, you get that integer five. And so you can write something like bang r plus three and you get eight as expected. But if we decide to update that, that, uh, that reference, let's say let's set it to 20, we don't get any value back because we have done this uh, we have done this operation for its side effect we've modified r and we have no value we really need to return it's just a unit and so now that we've updated r what happens to bang r it's 20 and bang r plus 3 is 23 but look up here on line 23 ironically enough r bang r plus 3 used to be 8 and now when we evaluate it, bang r plus 3 is 23. The contents of r have changed, and this program um, is no longer what's called referentially transparent. So in a purely functional language, if you have the same expression and you evaluate it twice, you get the same answer. In an effectful language with state, that's no longer true. It's no longer guaranteed. And if we want to model state in in type theory, uh, well, how do we do that? Well, let's follow the pattern of OCaml or ML. And the idea is we have all our usual types like units and natural numbers and functions. And to this, we're going to add a new type constructor, ref x, which is the type of pointers to x. And we're going to have the usual constructs of the Lambda calculus, units, natural numbers, functions, applications, and what we're going to do is we're going to add some operations, new e to create a reference, bang e to dereference a pointer, e, assigns, e gets assigned to e prime is the update operation. And we're also going to introduce, for reasons that will become clear later, a literal syntax of pointers. So in the rest of this um, lecture, if you see me write the letter L, what that means is that's the address of a pointer. It's sort of L for location. So if you printed it out in uh, in a uh, in, your, in a computer, this would actually be like a hexadecimal address, like you know the 64-bit address that tells you where in memory to look for the contents of L. And so what we're going to do is we're also going to extend our values to have pointer values and our uh, our operational semantics is going to actually need a model of memory. So we'll say a store is just a list mapping locations to values. And if we've got a list of locations and values, we're also going to need a store typing, which tells us what type is stored at each location. And so once we've got that, we can, uh, we can start giving the operational semantics of state and the and its type type theory so let's look at the operational semantics first and the one of the things that happens when we add state is that state ends up getting everywhere when when we have our application rule we it's going where we want to say if e naught steps to e naught prime then e naught e applied to e1 will step to e naught prime applied to e1 except now we have to keep track of the state. So what if E naught assigns to the heap? Well, in that case, sigma might go to sigma prime, and that means that E naught E1 with the store sigma goes to E naught prime E1 with the store sigma prime. So what we're doing is we're threading the store through the whole execution so that whenever we need the store, whenever we need to know what the contents of a pointer are, we have the store available. We have memory available to actually answer the question. And over here, but the other rules all need to thread that state around so that when the memory option, uh, actions like uh, uh, assignment and dereference occur, we actually have the memory available. 
So if E1 steps to E1 prime with a corresponding change to the to the to the store, then V naught E1 will step to V naught E1 prime with sigma prime. And the only case we don't have to do anything interesting with the store is in the actual beta reduction rule. So in the beta re reduction rule, we have lambda x dot e applied to v, and that just steps to v for x and e. And at this stage, where we actually reduce the function, no change happens to the heap, because the way that this works is that we just do the substitution and we don't need to update the store. And so the store is just getting passed along from one from one, one machine configuration to the next. And it's only when we get to the state rules that we actually start using the state. And so just like with all the other constructs, we're going to have a uh, set of congruence rules. So up here for new, we're going to evaluate new until it gets to a value. So if you see new e, what you want to do is you want to see, okay, does e evaluate to e prime? If so, then new e evaluates to new e prime. And as it's evaluating, we might update the store. So sigma will be allowed to go from sigma to sigma prime as well. And it's only when we have new v, where we're calling new on a value, that something actually happens. And what we're going to do is we're going to extend the store with a location l that it's that points to the value v. And because new is a dynamic allocation, we need to know that this is a fresh address. And so the way we enforce that is with this side condition that says, well, you're allowed to pick any location L that you like as long as it's not in the domain of sigma. So we choose a new location to store v in and then we return that new location as the actual value, as the actual pointer value for that reference type. And one interesting thing here is that formally the rules for uh, uh, st a state have actually become non-deterministic. So what's happened is when the allocator runs, it gives us a location and we don't know anything at all about what it might be. And there's no guarantee that we're going to get the same location over and over again. And in fact, we rather hope that we don't because we need to know that a newly created pointer is different from everything else. And similarly, for dereferencing, we have a congruence rule. And when we dereference a location L, what we do is we look in the store and we say, does the location L have a value V associated with it? And if it does, then sigma bang L is going to step to sigma V. So we've looked something up in the store. And for assignments, E naught gets assigned to E1, we're going to have two congruence rules in order to evaluate, enforce left to right evaluation. So first, we're going to evaluate the L value, the pointer, and so we're going to say, does E naught step to E naught prime? Keep doing that until it becomes a value. And so if you have V naught gets set to E1, we want to evaluate E1 until eventually it becomes a value. And so now when you see the location L gets assigned the value V prime, what we're going to do is we're going to look inside the store and we're going to find the, that location L. And no matter what value V is there, we're going to change it to V prime. We've done the update. The old value is gone. There's no way to get back to it unless like somehow you saved it somewhere in your program. So assignment actually changes the store. New grows the store and reading needs the store to be there, but it doesn't modify it. And just as we threaded a store through the whole operational semantics of the Lambda Calculus with state, we need to do the same thing for the typing rules. So up here, the, this typing rule says that E has the type X under the context gamma of variables and the context sigma for store, ver for store locations. So sigma is telling us what type every location has and gamma is telling us what types e each of the bindings, the variables have. And so many of the rules are going to be very similar to the way they were before. So the hypothesis rule says that if x colon big X is in gamma, 
then the expression little x has the type big X, and it just ignores the store sigma. And unit introduction ignores the store sigma, like the unit value always has the unit type no matter what, and similarly for natural numbers. For function introductions, again, this is going to look exactly like the ordinary lambda calculus, except we're threading sigma through the judgments. So we add the uh, the binding little x has the type big X, and we check the body E at the type Y. And when we check the application, we check that E has the type X arrow Y, and E prime has the ty type X, in order to con conclude that the application has the type E applied to E prime, has the type Y. But in all these cases, we never actually look at the store typing. We just pass it along to some terms that might need it. And the subterms that might need it are actually the imperative terms. So if E has the type X, then new E has the type ref X. And here we're just passing the uh, store typing along. And when here, what we're going to do is we're going to say, well, if E is a reference pointing to an X, then bang E is going to give you that X. And if E is a referenced, uh, is an expression of reference type, and E prime is some contents, then we're allowed to assign to it. And so the only rule where we actually look at the store typing is this rule for the bare pointers. So if we have a location L, we know that it has the type ref X, just when L colon big X is in sigma. So you might ask, well, why do we have a typing rule for bare pointers L at all? After all, the programmers that people write, the programs that programmers actually write, essentially never do they have a pointer hard coded into it. And the reason for we have this is actually because of the reduction relation. We gave an operational semantics that said if we have a configuration of a store sigma e, it steps to a new configuration sigma prime e prime. And so what we want to do is we want to observe that when we take a step from new, uh, say from ba uh, from new v, what we do is we create a bare reference L as the return value. So even if a program doesn't have any bare references in it to start with, after you take a few steps, it may well have some locations and we need to know what their types are. And that's what this store typing does. And once we have a store typing, we can think, okay, well, how do we prove type safety? So the original type safety theorem that we proved talked about just individual terms. And it said, if you have a well-typed term E and it steps to E prime, then maybe types are preserved. And here, what we've got are machine configurations that say, give me a store sigma and an expression E, and I'll take sigma prime to E prime. And so the operational semantics actually talks about stores. And to prove type safety, we need to know something about the type of all the values in the store. So we need a store typing. And the way that a store typing works is it says that your first idea might be to say, well, I will check that sigma has the type big sigma if every location has the has the value of the right type. And this is almost the right idea. And the reason that it's not quite the right idea is we need to do just a little bit more. So our store typing rule is almost as simple as just checking every value has the right type. So we say under the uh, store typing big sigma, the the store little sigma prime has the, t has the store typing big sigma prime. And the way it works is you say, well, the empty store has the empty store typing in any context sigma. And secondly, if in the context big sigma, little sigma prime has the store typing big sigma prime, and we're able to show under sigma that V has the type X, then we can 
extend the store typing. We can say sigma prime L colon V has the type big sigma prime L colon X. And the reason that we have to have this apparently redundant store typing is because we can build circular values with uh, circular references with references. So if you create a reference, create a pointer to it, and then update the first reference to point to the second, you have a loop in your uh, in your pointer in your pointer graph, and so you need to know what all of the types are up front in order to have a sensible notion of store typing, because otherwise you don't you don't know. Uh, what the type of the uh, pointer should be after you removed it, after checking one of them. And finally, what we can do is we can say a machine configuration, little sigma e, is well typed at big sigma x when sigma is a store typing of type big sigma in the store typing sigma. So this is saying that little sigma has the type big sigma, and moreover, all of the locations that might ever be referenced are in big sigma. And if we have this kind of self-consistent store, we check that the expression E has the type big X under that store configuration, under that store typing. And so a configuration will judge to be well-typed if the store and the term are both well-typed. And so if we try to prove progress and preservation, what we will find is that we'll be able to prove one of them relatively easy. So we'll say if you have a well-typed machine configuration, then either it's in a terminal configuration where E is a value, or it can take a step. And then we can also prove preservation, which says, well, if you have a well-typed machine configuration sigma E, and we know that sigma E steps to sigma prime E prime, then the new store and the new expression have the type sigma x. Well, it turns out that the type preservation is actually false. It looks plausible, but it's simply not true. And here's an example of why. So note that in this example on line one, we have an empty, con empty store typing, an empty store with an empty store typing, and we have new unit. And this yields, uh, this has the type ref unit in the empty store typing. But when you evaluate new unit, you get L colon unit and you return L for some L. And it really is not the case that L colon unit semicolon L has the type ref unit in the empty, in the empty store typing. The heap has grown and the old store typing is no longer suitable for it. And so if we want to prove anything about type safety, we have to have a story for what to do when the store grows. And so what we're going to do is we're going to say, we're going to define a notion of store extension. We'll say that sigma is below sigma prime when there is some extension sigma double prime such that sigma prime is equal to the old sigma plus sigma double prime. And so another way of thinking about this is that sigma is contained within big sigma prime. So, so in this way, we can talk about the heap growing using this less than or equal to property. And so what we'll be able to do is we'll be able to prove a store monotonicity lemma, which says that, well, if you have sigma and an extension sigma prime, then if E has the type X under big sigma, then it will still have the type X under the extended store typing sigma prime. And the same goes for the store typing. So if, uh, if sigma naught has the store typing big sigma naught, in the sort of universal store typing big sigma, then when you grow it, sigma naught will still have the type a big sigma sub zero. And so these are a little bit tedious to prove, but they're not too hard. You just use structural induction on the appropriate derivation. And so what this property means is that allocating new references can be phrased in such a way that it never breaks typeability. So what we could do is we can 
state everything in terms of extensions, and so our preservation theorem can be adjusted to say that, well, if you have a well-typed configuration that takes a step, then that new configuration will also be well-typed, but maybe in a larger, uh, in a in a larger store, store typing. Okay, so when we've changed our judgments, we have to prove a whole bunch of substitution and structural properties. So we have to show that if he has the type X in a context gamma gamma prime, we're allowed to stick a variable Z colon big Z into the middle. And once we have weakening, we prove exchange, which says that you're allowed to change the order of variables. And with weakening in exchange, we can prove that if you have an expression E of type X and an E prime with a whole of type X, you can apply the substitution and you still have something that's well typed. So E for X and E prime will still have the type Z. And these proofs will look almost identical to the proofs of weakening exchange and substitution for the simply li typed lambda calculus. There's almost no change except that you write big sigma semicolon a lot more times. And with the substitution theorem, what we're able to do is we're able to repair the type safety proof. So the progress theorem is the same as it always is. We say if we have a well-typed machine configuration, then either the expression E is a value and no further reductions can take place, or there is some configuration that you could take a step to. And with the way that we state type preservation is we say, well, if we have a machine configuration that's well typed and the machine configuration takes a step, then there is some extension of the store typing that will tell you that sigma prime E prime has the store typing big sigma prime X. And so what we're doing is we're saying, well, if you have an expression, you're allowed to write ref in it and that will grow the, grow the store. And so the proof goes just the way it always does. For progress, we do induction on the typing derivation of E. And for preservation, we do induction on the derivation of the reduction relation, in this case, sigma E to sigma prime E prime. And the interesting thing is that the typing rules for adding higher order state are very, very innocuous. They're very easy to do. People figured it out in the 70s, but it's really, really much more powerful than you expect. So suppose that in the plain, pure, total, simply terminating, simply typed lambda calculus, someone handed you this unknown function f. And they said, I promise it's not malware. In fact, I promise that it actually has the type unit arrow unit to unit. And if you give me this second order function, then I will give you a natural number. So in the pure lambda calculus, what does this function compute? And the answer is, it's a constant function. No matter what f you pass, when, no matter what function you pass to f, it will always give you the same answer. And the reason is that the only thing we can do with our argument is to give it some further, some more arguments. And so the only thing we can actually compute from this functional argument, unit arrow, unit to unit, the only thing we, that we can do is we can call it and we get out a unit and we can't do anything with that unit. So we'll get the natural number and that's the only natural number that we can possibly get out of f. So no matter what f of g does with its argument, g can only ever return a unit. And so the argument to f can never influence the value that f actually produces. And so this gives you a humongous amount of power. So I argued in the previous slide that this function f is a constant function, but as soon as you have state, it, this is no longer true. So this function, which I call count, actually takes an argument and then it returns to you a natural number saying how many times was that function's function argument called. And so it's really easy to implement. What we do is we say, okay, well, we're going to create a counter R, initialize it to zero, 
And then what we're going to do is we're going to define a function increment of type unit arrow unit. And what increment does is it receives a unit, which it ignores, and then it updates the reference to the new, va the new value that the top level wants to give it. And then once we've done that, we can call f of inc. And so this function actually does modifies the state and it initializes a counter and then it called, creates a function inc which silently increments that counter and then it passes the increment function to its argument r f and then it returns the value of the counter r instead of returning the value of f and so it's returning the number of times that increment was called okay and so that is a powerfully strange use of, uh, of, uh, of state, but things get even wilder. So this function right here is called not, and it's called not because it's named after Landon's not. And Peter Landon was a computer scientist who lived in the, uh, who lived a number of decades ago, and he invented implementing recursion and loops by backpatching. So you have a symbolic value and you do a, you, uh, you do a second pass where you update it with where it's supposed to go. And so he took this idea from assembly language and he applied it to functional languages. And he said, well, if you want a fixed point operator, which I'm going to call not, it's something which takes a function that you want to take the fixed point of and it gives you that function. So this is going to actually be used to implement recursion. So it's a bit like the Y Combinator, except we're going to implement it with state. And the way that he did this was he said, well, if you give me this higher order function F, then I'm going to create a pointer to some dummy function that takes a natural number N and always returns a zero. Now we're going to write a function recur which says, well, when it gets an argument, it looks up in this reference R, which function to call, and calls it with the argument N. And then we're going to update R with a function, with an invocation of this thing that we want to take the fixed point of, and our implementation of the fixed point in recur. And so now, if you think of f as that recursive function, we're saying, well, you can unfold it one level in order to do the recursion. And then it returns back to you a beautiful function which has implemented the recursion. And so this is a really difficult thing to get your head around, and you really, really need to implement it and play with it yourself. So let's actually do that here. So let's write not. And it's going to take a function f that we want to take a, uh, a fixed point of. And what we're going to do is we're going to say, OK, give me a dummy. And then I'm going to write a recur function, which takes a natural number. And what it's going to do is it's going to dereference this location r, and it's going to pass the argument n to it. So let me just double check that I'm doing this right. Yep. And now, once we're going, what we're going to do is we're going to say that r gets set to a function and then we're going to return recur. There we go. Now we're getting the uh, now we're getting the uh, precedence right. So what we're doing is we're creating that that location, putting a dummy function into it, and then our implementation of recur says, well, what you want to do is you want to look up in that pointer your implementation, and then we set that r to f of recur of n. And so this thing, when every every time it's called, is going to is going to call the function recursively. And so now what we can do so we'll say give me give me a our implementation of factorial 
and n, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to say what I'm going to say is that well if n is equal to 0 then I'm going to return 1 and otherwise I'm going to call my implementation of fact at n minus 1 and you can see here that this fact f has the type int arrow int to int arrow int. And so now what we can do is we can say, okay, let fact equal not of fact f. And so now let's try it out. Fact of five is going to give us, uh, oh, one here because I forgot to multiply it. And now when we call fact of 5, we get 120. And so it's actually well worth tracing out how this works for yourself. So, so take this, uh, take this non-recursive function, and then we feed it to Landon's not, and it gets turned into a recursive function. So we're able to use a pointer to implement a, fu a recursive function. So what this should tell you is that termination is no longer going to be true. So Landon's not let us define recursive functions and as a result we can write non-terminating programs. So every type will be inhabited and consistency will fail. Okay, so how about we do that? Well, let's do not of let's say fun fn to fn and we'll give it zero and we'll see what happens. So we've, unfortunately, we've correctly implemented recursion and this function is never going to stop. So if you think about it, let's call loop not fun fn goes to fn and if you call loop on zero, what we're going to get is that same infinite loop. Okay, so is there any way to fix this problem? Because we went to all this trouble in order to get a nice logical interpretation, and we've learned that consistency and termination go in hand in hand, and we've lost it. So do we have to choose between it being able to change the world and logical consistency? So you might wonder, is there some way to get both of these possibilities? Or another way of putting it is, is there a Curry-Howard interpretation for fx? And since I'm asking these questions only at lecture seven, you can guess that this is a rhetorical question. There is a, of course there's a way to retain logical consistency and still have state. And so we're going to look at a modal logic that was suggested by Curry in 1952. And if you're a Haskell programmer, you know of this idea as a monad. And possibly you may have heard of effect systems. And all three of these things are actually exactly the same thing, and we're going to start looking at it.